Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of Deuteronomy. Well, hello there and happy Wednesday, faithful listener. This is Jen here with the Bible Explained podcast, and today we're going to be discussing the waters of Meribah. And you might recognize that as something that we discussed out of numbers before. But yeah, we are going to discuss that all over again. And I'm going to bring a new perspective potentially to you guys regarding the waters of Meribah. Because once again, as Moses is going through Deuteronomy and orating it, orating the law to the people, he is retelling the history of everything that went on. So now we are at the waters of Meribah, where Moses committed his sin that made him not allowed to go into the promised land. Now, before we begin all this, just a word from our sponsor, which is myself. (laughs) But anyway, check the links in the bio of this podcast episode, and you're going to find everything and everywhere that P40 Ministries is. So go to each of those things and subscribe. You know, the YouTube channel is up and running finally. It's been up and running, but I finally have some content on there. I'm going to be producing more content for the YouTube channel. So please go over to the YouTube page and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss anything over there. And then also you're going to find my contact information in the bio of the podcast episode and the information regarding the books that I have written. And the one that is brand new that just came out is the Adore, the Advent devotional for teenage girls and advent is literally around the corner it is like two weeks away so grab a copy for your daughter or for your girls group or if you know a teenage girl that could use an advent devotional check out the adore advent devotional for teenage girls and you'll find that link in the bio of this podcast episode but let's go ahead and read deuteronomy chapter 3 verses 23 through 29 today this is actually finishing out this chapter of deuteronomy and we're going to move into chapter 4 on Friday. So feel free to pause this podcast episode and grab your cup of coffee or your cup of tea this morning and uh, join me as we read Deuteronomy 3 verses 23 through 29. As always, of course, I'm going to be reading at the W.E.B. version this morning. I begged Yahweh at that time saying, Lord, Yahweh, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do works like yours and mighty acts like yours? Please let me go over and see the good land that is beyond the Jordan, that fine mountain and Lebanon. But Yahweh was angry with me because of you and didn't listen to me. Yahweh said to me, that is enough. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift up your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and see with your eyes, for you shall not go over the Jordan, but commission Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you shall see. So we stayed in the valley near Beth Peor. I do find it absolutely hilarious that um, Moses uh, blames the people for the sin that he committed at Meribah. I I just find that so funny. (laughs) And it's probably very likely that Moses truly did blame the people for it, because we're going to read this in a moment in Numbers chapter 20. We're going to see that the people really did aggravate and irritate Moses to get to this point. However... Moses did it himself. You know, he made the choice to disobey God and to do what God asked him not to do. And then he got punished for it. Now, I don't believe that Moses would have been not allowed to go into the promised land had he not done that, because that was really when God said that Moses would not be allowed to enter into the promised land. And why this was so important to Moses. I mean, think about this, like Moses was the leader of Israel. He greatly cared. You can see how much Moses cares, though in Deuteronomy, he's he's sick of the people. You can just <laughs> you can just tell by by some of the verbiage he uses that he is just like tired of the crap, you know? He's just tired. But he really did care about his people. He cared so much that he regularly intervened for his people when God was like, I'm going to destroy these people. Like, I am sick of them. Moses is like, no, don't do it, Lord. Don't do it. And then the Lord relents. So Moses, yes, he, he truly did care about his people. He might have been tired of them now and then, as we often get with our jobs, but he did care. 
So if he's doing something for like 40 years of his life, because that's pretty much how long Moses was, uh, <laughs> Moses was the leader, if not a little bit longer, actually, because Moses died at the end of the 40 years in the desert. And then on top of that, we don't know how long Moses was the leader before that time period. I would guess a few years, if not several years, Moses um, was commissioned to lead the Israeli people. So, of course, Moses wanted to lead his people beyond the Jordan River and to see the promised land. Of course, he wanted to do that. I'm sure that this was a huge struggle to Moses that he was not allowed to go into the promised land. And we we see that right here in verse 23. I begged Yahweh at that time saying, Lord, Yahweh, you know, he's begging God. And it sounds to me like he begged God a lot on this matter. Because finally, God was like, I don't want to hear another word. So I don't think that this was just once or twice that that Moses was begging God. I think he begged God quite a bit on this matter, saying, please, Lord, I know that you're angry with me, but please let me go over and see the good land that you promised your people. Let me finish this to completion. Let me finish what you have started through me. Right. I mean, Moses really wanted that. And he was not allowed to get it. God was very firm on that boundary he made with Moses that Moses was not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. God made that boundary and stuck with it to the very end. And Moses did not go into the promised land. Unfortunately, that uh, role was left up to Joshua, who was Moses' second in command. And I can imagine that Moses was really struggling with some jealousy. You know, I mean, I, I would be. I would very much be struggling with jealousy if I was put in a similar position where um, I was the leader of something, but yet was not allowed to like finish that job or um, was not allowed to see the glory of what would happen to it or the completion of it. I can imagine I'd be very jealous if God was like, no, your second in command is going to going to finish the job for you. I'd be like, what? No, that's not fair. <laughs> So I'm sure Moses was struggling with with a lot here, which is why he's begging God. But let's see why God did this in the first place. Let's see why God told Moses he was not allowed to go into the promised land. So turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Numbers chapter 20. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'll know that I already discussed all this with you. But let's talk about it again. Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 through 13. I'll read this once again. Actually, no, I'm going to read it out of the NIV version, (laughs) not the W.E.B. But yeah, Numbers 22 through 13, it says, Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You shall bring water out of the rock for the community, so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. So, I mean, yeah, you can see that Moses totally disobeyed God. (laughs) Because, I mean, right here in verse eight, after the people come to this area, you know, where there is no water. You know, this is a wilderness. This is desert land, basically. Or rather, there's very little in it. It's a wilderness. The people are complaining. They're crying. They're upset because there is no water for the people. And I mean, the people definitely should have known at this point in time that God was with them. This is well into numbers. In fact, this is 
getting into the second generation of people here, because we do see at the very, very beginning of this chapter, Numbers 20, that Miriam had died. The death of the older generation was just beginning to happen, and the younger generation was growing up. So we can definitely see that maybe there was a mixture between the parents and the children here that are complaining against Moses and Aaron and God for bringing them into this wilderness because they're still crying about having to leave Egypt. So they're still like the good old days in Egypt when we were slaves and in misery. (laughs) That's what they say in verse five. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. So, I mean, they do have some legitimate concerns, right? I mean, there's no water. I mean, we definitely need water to survive, but they didn't, once again, they didn't have to go about it this way. Like this older generation was teaching their children that God's provision was not enough for them and that God was not going to take care of them. And what's so frustrating, I'm going to guess, about this moment for Moses and Aaron is that God was among his people. It actually says in scripture, we read this, that God did not leave his people. His presence was basically always there in the form of either a cloud or of fire at night. And so since God's presence was always there, the people should have known enough to know that they could have asked God gently for water and not complained against Moses and Aaron and against God once again. So this was a very frustrating moment for Moses. He's about done with the people, you know, I mean, I can imagine already at this point, he is infuriated that they did not go into the promised land. So Moses and Aaron leave the people and they cry before God at the entrance of the tent of meeting and God's glory appears to them, to both of them. And remember, Aaron was Moses's brother and he was also the high priest at this point in time. So the Lord says to Moses, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. What's interesting about this moment in time also is that this is really the last great complaint that happens before the people take the promised land. The older generation was still around, right? They still had this (laughs) glory days kind of syndrome happening. But once the children end up growing up, that kind of fades away because the children obviously are going to forget what life was like back in Egypt. All they really know at this point in time is the wilderness. That's what they grew up in. That's what they survived in. So it's just going to be a little different after this point in time. But since the older generation and the younger generation are both intermixed at this point, this moment in time was very crucial for the younger generation to understand God's amazing power. Though they might have known about God's power and seen his presence in the cloud and in the fire, this was a very defining moment for God making himself holy to the next generation of people and them really seeing this wonderful miracle that was about to take place. But Moses, unfortunately, is so angry and he's blinded by rage from the people that he disobeys God's command and he strikes the rock, not once, but twice strikes it and the water pours out because God's mercy, of course, in God's mercy, he was still going to feed his people. He was still going to allow the people to have the nourishment, the water that they needed and the livestock also. So even though Moses sinned, God was still made holy. But then God says to Moses, you did not obey me. You did not speak to the rock like I told you to. Rather, you struck it. You and Aaron both are not going into the promised land. And I'm going to guess Aaron was right there beside Moses. Aaron was just as angry. Aaron did not trust in God's promises. And both of them together were part of this this sin. But here's what is so sinful about this. Not only did Moses put himself on the same level as God, (laughs) shall we bring water out of the rocks? I mean, come on, Moses was not bringing nothing out of the rock. He was just a human being. And he put himself on the same level as God performing this miracle, right? That was a a, a big sin that Moses elevated himself. But not only that, many scholars like to say that this rock symbolized Jesus Christ. Because we actually see that there's a verse in 1 Corinthians that talks about the rock 
being Jesus, where water poured out of him, like living water. And it's a direct parallel to this story. And if you remember what happened years before this, Moses had actually struck a rock once before, several years prior to this. But God had commanded Moses at that point to strike the rock so that the water would come gushing out. So Moses had already struck the rock. You know, Jesus was struck for our sins, but he doesn't need to be struck again. And Moses struck the rock twice on top of that. So this is the third time Moses strikes the rock because he struck it twice in this incident, incident and then once before this. Jesus did not need to be struck twice. And if this is a symbolism of Jesus, if the rock symbolizes what happened to Jesus, Jesus was struck once for our sins. And then now through faith, we come to Jesus. And here's what God said to Moses after he, he made the sin of striking the rock twice. God says to Moses, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy. Right there. Moses didn't have enough faith in God to provide water by just speaking words to the rock. So that's kind of a parallel where nowadays we, you and I, we come to Jesus through faith. Unfortunately, Moses did not have that faith. So that's another interesting correlation that might be the reason why God was so strict with his boundary and his punishment of Moses, that Moses was not allowed to finish his job of bringing the people into the promised land because Moses just did not have enough faith is kind of where I think God is getting at. And even though Moses is begging and pleading with God, if we go back to Deuteronomy 3, God is like, no, no, you are not going into the promised land. Rather, strengthen and encourage Joshua because he's going to take over the job for you and he is going to bring the people into the land. And we do see that Joshua was a man with with very great faith. We're going to move into the book of Joshua soon, which is all about Joshua. And we see that he had tremendous, tremendous faith in God and great belief in God. So Moses's role now is not to bring the people into the land, but to encourage Joshua to have that faith in God, to lead the people into the promised land. So all of this just kind of shows God does judge leaders very harshly. And I think that that is necessary if a person is going to be a good leader. People who are leaders need to take the role very seriously. And for example, me, I wouldn't really consider myself a leader in a lot of aspects, but I do teach the Bible. I mean, I'm on the podcast every day teaching the Bible and God is going to judge me harsher than another person who just listens to the podcast. Because if I'm sitting here teaching stuff that is contrary to scripture, or if I'm sitting here teaching that my opinion is fact, when in actuality it is not fact, that is something that God takes very, very seriously. So I need to be very careful with what I say. And this is why I tell you guys, always read the Bible. You know, like, don't just take my word for it. Don't just uh, take what I say for fact. Just crack open your Bible and just read it for yourself, because that's really the best way that you can gain knowledge as to what the, the scriptures say. So don't just take anybody's word for it. Nobody. Just read it for yourself. That is something I'm very passionate about. And also, if you are a leader, if you're a church leader, if you're a parent, if you uh, lead a, a small group, it is very important to remain diligent with what God has given us. It's, it's important to do that because God does judge leaders more harshly than he does others. So that's just a word of caution. But faithful listeners, I hope you liked this episode and that you share it on your social media platforms or just tell people that the Bible Explained podcast exists because word of mouth is an excellent way to spread the podcast around and to get people interested and listening to it. You're going to find all my links in the bio of this podcast episode. Click on each one and subscribe to each thing. But I'll see you guys tomorrow for an episode out of Luke. We're going to finish up talking about Luke very soon here and we're moving into some of the saddest portions of Luke, which is is talking about Jesus's death. So tune in tomorrow for that and I'll see you bright and early. Happy listening and God bless. Ooh.